let's get started. Um, so today the plan will be, we'll go finish, finish up this lecture six slide deck. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end so we can either start off hours early or talk about the project if you guys have kind of general questions for that. Um, do I have anything else to say? Yeah, let's just let's just hop into into this and we'll do a, a bit of review of where we were a week ago. We keep losing Mondays, so um, <laughs> we'll do a bit of a bit of recap. Okay, so if you remember, we were doing um, we were trying to reduce um, uh, each of the different kinds of cash misses that we discussed. So we had the um, compulsory ones, conflict and capacity. We, we started with looking at how we can reduce compulsory misses. One of the, one of the ways is to just increase your cash line size. This makes your processor pull in more data each time it requests memory. And so if you have lots of spatial locality, that's going to really help because you're pulling in not only the piece of data that you're looking for, but also the next few pieces of data as well. And that can really help um, performance. But the disadvantage is, well, if I, there we go. The disadvantage is that if you pull in too much, you're going to pull in stuff that you don't need. So if we are like, well, let's just pull in a gigabyte each time. Well, you probably don't need that whole gigabyte. And also that's totally impractical. Um, the other thing that we, we touched on a lot was this prefetching idea where we basically speculate what accesses we will observe in the future. Um, we can do this either in hardware or in software or using some mixed scheme. Um, and that allows, allows us to pull in the data before we actually need it. Uh, so we looked at um, uh, some code where it's pretty easy for the hardware to figure out what the, the step is. In this case, it's just every integer, so every four bytes. Um, and we looked at a, a few different uh, kinds of prefetching that can be enabled in hardware. We looked at this article as well. Um, I keep shocking it, and then it just spazzes out the HDMI adapter. It's really annoying. Um, but there's kind of a problem, and this is going to be just a, this is always the trade-off with pretty much everything we do. There's going to be some trade-off. Um, in this case, the, the trade-off is that we might pull in data that we don't need, thus evicting data that we do need in L1, uh, which is not ideal, right? We, we, we don't want to uh, pollute our L1 cache with data that isn't necessary. Um, we talked about software prefetching. The difficulty here isn't prediction because that's pretty easy if we're doing the programming. It's doing it at the right time. Um, it, it's bad if you do it too early or too late. So, so that's going to be the difficulty there. And then we talked about um, instruction prefetching, where um, we're fetching the instructions, and because they are more more likely to be accessed sequentially, we can pull in two blocks of instructions, uh, one of them into L1, and then the other into the stream buffer. And if we miss an L1, we can just go, go look in the stream buffer for the data that we um, need, because it's most likely going to be there since we're just going straight down through our instruction um, uh, instructions. All right, so then the last thing that we looked at was that you can just modify your code to actually take advantage 
of uh, memory access pattern. So this was an example of a program where we have um, uh, some some velocity. Uh, I don't know what f is, but who cares? And then p. So we have these three different fields in our struct, and if we do a struct, a, a list of structs, what is going to happen with the data layout is that they're going to, like each of the the v values is going to be fairly far away from the other v values. There's going to be a bunch of f and p values between them. And the problem with that is that down here in this for loop, we aren't going to be taking advantage of spatial locality as much because there's a bunch of crap in between all the Vs that we care about. So we can restructure our code. Um, maybe it's a little bit less nice to look at, right? Now we have Vs, Fs, and Ps instead of this nice little struct thing. But we have an advantage of being able to access them. Uh, uh, sequentially, all the V values are going to be right next to each other. They'll be pulled in on the same cache line, potentially, or at the very least, it'll be really easy to predict where to prefetch the, the values that we need. All right, that was a pretty quick whirlwind review. Any questions? So probably pay attention to the prefetching thing. You may or may not see that on project two. And by that, I mean, you will see it on project two. Um, okay. So let's talk about the next category of misses. This one's conflict misses. So these are the ones that occur when you um, have some data in the cache and then you evict it and then you need it again. And you need to reload it. Um, so when do these occur? This is the real question um, that we have to uh, answer before we can figure out mitigation. So if we have a direct map cache, um, any other request that's mapped to the same cache line is going to cause a conflict miss, or could cause a conflict miss. Um, it most likely will. Um, Unless the unless that exact uh, block in the cache is is open, so we request one. Uh, if we have um, a four block cache and we request block eight and block sixteen, for example, or twelve, any multiple of four, they're all going to map to zero, which means that. Uh, uh, they'll they'll kick each other in and out of that block, causing conflict misses. But luckily, most of the time we have associative caches, so we have a few different blocks in the same set. Um, but it's still a problem, right? Because we we likely will have too many different requests mapped to that same set. Um, you know, if our cache is only three megabytes or something, and the memory space is 250 gigabytes, it's pretty evident that there's going to be a lot of stuff mapping to the same set, even if we do have a fairly high associativity. So let's take a look at a code example of this happening. This is a um, uh, if we assume that there's a four kilobyte cache and we just have some code that just loops forever and then inside of the loop we we go through i up to a very large number and we increment i by 4k well we're guaranteed that those are all going to map to the same at least the same um, um, uh, set um, and then they'll they'll kick each other in and out, and that'll be a bad time. So this is an example of when you would basically see 
uh, conflict misses. You'd see some compulsory and then conflict for once you've loaded all the data in at once. All right, questions on how this works. All right. Here's another reason why they might happen. Um, so we kind of know the, the stack and the heap. Um, in general, operating systems will allocate um, and align them into large chunks of memory. So let's just say maybe 128 megabytes. Um, so it'll you know, allocate this entire thing for your stack and heap initially. Unless it's Java, then it's, it better allocate like a gig or, Java, you know, heaven forbid, a, uh, an Electron app, 10 gigs there. Um, and a lot of times, if you have multiple threads, the same thing will happen. So you might have uh, the stack and the heap for your program aligned at these 128 megabyte intervals, for example. Um, and if your threads are doing the same thing, same memory access pattern um, at the same time, um, you know, hitting the same cache, um, they're going to kind of end up occupying the same areas of your cache, which means you're going to have a bunch of conflicts between these threads. This thread wants to store something in set zero. This thread wants to store something in set zero. And then the first thread comes back and it's gone. The data that they wanted was gone. So one thing that we could do is randomize the base of each thread stack. So now instead of everyone just being aligned on uh, you know, uh, the same kind of set here, um, now we're kind of staggered. So, so no longer will we have as many as many conflicts. That's one option. Um, another thing to note is as far as the heap goes, large data structures are also often aligned as well. So you could randomize where you allocate um, using malloc, and that can help reduce the amount of time that you'll have conflicts. And you know, so the thing, the thing about um, about caches uh, in hardware is the hash functions mod, right? It's pretty bad. It's pretty lame hash. Um, obviously, in software, if we do a hash and then it's you know some uh, some more secure or at least more randomized thing, and then it'll distribute across. Uh, the values that we want, whereas in hardware, that's not necessarily the case. Um, so we kind of have to do some mitigations software side with, with the allocation of memory to allow that, that mod hash function to be a little bit better for us. Um, yeah. Okay, conflict, that's conflict misses. Um, obviously, another fairly evident way of reducing conflict misses would just be to increase associativity as much as you can. But we'll talk about some trade offs to that uh, later. Okay, questions before we move on to capacity misses. Okay, so what is a capacity miss? A capacity miss is when we're trying to use more data um, than can be fit into our cache. So let's let's add some terminology to this. Um, we call the the data that we're currently using that's currently important to our program. We call that the working set because that's what it's using to do its work. Um, and if that working set is bigger than the cache, 
you're going to end up with a bunch of misses because you just literally can't fit enough into your cache. Um, so, you know, obviously uh, you're going to have to sh uh, shuffle in and out some data. There, so these are these capacity misses generally are fairly hard to measure just because um, uh, it's kind of hard to tell whether or not a, an eviction is, is because there's too much capacity or because like just it's just the associativity. You know, there's a bit of gray area there. Um, so one definition that I, I think is one of the easier ones to think about is it's the non-compulsory miss rate in an equivalently, equivalently sized fully associative cache. So the intuition here is if we take away all the compulsory misses, so that's this part, and the conflict misses, the conflict misses only arise when we have to deal with things mapping to the same uh, set. Um, and they can't go to a different set, for example, um, then what we have left are capacity misses. And if we have fully associative, then that means we can put our, our cache line anywhere in our cache. Um, so we won't ever have any, any issues where maybe one set's totally empty, but this set is having a lot of contention. Um, we'll never have any problems like that. So we can, uh, we can get rid of those misses um, and then we just take the non-compulsory misses, which are a little bit easier to, to figure out, like have you requested the data or not is, is the heuristic or uh, definition there. Now, again, it's still kind of hard because you, you, there's, you aren't gonna be able to find a fully associative cache um out in the wild so th this may just involve doing a trace of your memory accesses and then doing a simulation for example uh to figure out what's what's going on so let's talk about some just basic ways that we can just eliminate our capacity misses obviously the first and most obvious one is just make your cache bigger and if you have a bigger cache you're going to run into capacity misses less because, well, it's bigger. Another way is that you can make your cache um, uh, more associative. So this kind of helps um, in a non in an associative cache. Um, but the problem is that it's going to cost significant area just for the transistors to deal with figuring out which one of your tags is right. Um, and that's gonna make your cache slow. So uh, another mitigation is the hierarchy that we already have. Um, so we have our cache hierarchy of L1, L2, L3. Obviously L1 is the smallest. And if our working set falls out of L1, maybe L2 can still be utilized maybe our working set is only uh, two megabytes, for example, and L2 cache can hold two megabytes, um, but L1 cache can hold like 500, 512 uh, kilobytes. Well, at least, at least we'll be hitting L2. We won't be hitting L1 all the time, but it's a lot better than having to go out to L3 or out to memory. So how do you figure out how big to, to make each one of these? Um, in practice, you kind of just make L1 as big as you can uh, within a cycle time, so one cycle. So you, you want to be able to go out to L1 and get a response back within one clock cycle. Um, Because if it's not within one cycle, then it's like, why are you even, why do you even have this L1? Um, you, you want it to be almost as fast as registers. Um, and then L2 and L3, you kind of just make them as big as you can without, you know, compromising uh, um, 
your other things on your chip and your, you know, the space that you have uh, on chip. So L2 is kind of once you've once you make your processor, put in some L1 cache. L, L2 cache generally is just the rest of your core, and then L3. Once you've put all your cores on your CPU, then you just put the rest, make the rest of it um, L3 and your memory controller and some other smaller controllers as well. Now, uh, there's some other ways. Obviously, the programmer can help out the, the computer as well. Um, one of the primary ways that uh, you can do that is using this method called tiling. And let's just so let's just assume that we have this application that that makes a bunch of passes over some large two dimensional array. Um, we're doing each pass is just going to blow out our cache. It's going to just it's way too big to spit in our cache. So here's here's a little diagram. We have green would be our first pass, then red is our second pass, blue is the third, pink yellow etc and if we if we uh if we just iterate over this you know row wise like this then that's gonna blow out our cache we're not gonna you know by the time we get back up on the second pass to the first element here it's long gone out of our cache So what can we do? Well, if it's possible, and this isn't always possible with every single application, but maybe it, we're lucky and it is for ours, what we'll do is we'll block uh, or, or tile the loop to prevent, to prevent this blowout. Um, so here's the tiled version. Now we're only going over this first part of our two-dimensional array. And then we're going to the second pass on this this uh, this tile of our array, and then we just do all of those. And if we're lucky, you know, we've we know something about the processor or something like that, and we're able to tune the iteration. Um, if we're lucky, then this is going to really uh, improve performance because every single pass, you'll be able to just find it in cache. Um, so the green, red, blue, pink, and then yellow. It's already, all your data is there. So you don't have to, um, you aren't blowing it out every single time. Then you move on to this one and then, well, it's fine to blow away the stuff from these, this part of your array because you don't need it anymore. Um, you can also do some like hierarchical tiling to kind of match your different levels of uh, me the memory hierarchy. So maybe you um, can, can have not only iteration on, on this kind of tile scale, but also some smaller tiles to make sure that it's fitting in with, within L1. Um, that's also an option. Okay. So any questions? I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, are there any uh, processors or has it, has it ever been the case where when we have to like go out to L2 cache um, to see if we hit there, if we do hit an L, <clears throat> if we do hit an L2 cache, can we ever, like in any cases, can we ever just get our information from L2 cache and access it there without having to pull it into L1, or does, or, or has it always been the case where yeah. we object from L1 and then pull into L1? Um. So yeah, I mean that that was, so the question was, are there any cases where you, if you miss an L1 but hit an L2, 
can just pull data straight from L2 and not pull it into L1 as well? Yes. I think we'll talk about that later. Maybe. Maybe down here. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a in a few slides. Um, but yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Um, and it's a decision that computer architects have to make. Uh, in general, these days people make the decision that you do pull it into L1. Um, generally, uh, I, I mean, I, I think that it's mainly because um, locality is just, you know, you want it in L1 to take advantage of locality. Um, and so, and also programs are kind of, programmers are attuned to kind of this locality idea. So making it do what the programmer is probably expecting would be, you know, good. What are the tiles referring to? So the tiles are basically referring to these, oh, where's my cursor? There it is. These segments that we made, these blocks uh, of our large array. So this represents a large array. And then we split it up into tiles. So the tile would be this first, let's just say this is like 1,024 integers across and down and, and up and down. Well, we've now split it into 512 by 512 and 512 by 512. And that would be our tile. Why does breaking the tiles up like that uh, reduce the number of misses? Why does this help? Um, yeah, so the reason is that if we can fit this entire array, this entire part of the array, this you know 512 by 512 block into our cache, and then just keep keep using that each uh, each time for each pass uh, in our in our program and then move on to the next one, we will, won't have to evict all of these, this data and then, you know, uh, whereas here, we would have to evict all the data because we've filled up our cache by the time we were like here and we keep going, we would loop all the way back up to the top, data would be gone. How do we differentiate between a conflict and a capacity miss? My understanding is that the capacity miss would mean that the data was already in cache. Yeah. Um, so I guess the way I would say it is like a conflict miss is potentially avoidable if you manage to get that block into a different stack then you wouldn't have a conflict in, in, that, in that set. Where the, a, a capacity miss is entirely unavoidable because even if you perfectly allocated all of your, uh, all of your cache lines, so they perfectly fill up your cache to 100%, you're still not gonna, you're gonna have to evict something because you ran out of room in the cache. So that's the difference. One of them is avoidable if you are better at allocating into different sets. The other one, entirely unavoidable. Okay, other questions? So we'll, look at the worksheet now and we'll talk about, um, think about the effects that prefetching has, go back to prefetching and think about the effects that it has on the different types of misses, so compulsory, capacity, and conflict. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a, a couple minutes to think about these and write something down.
Any ideas on this first one? What effects may prefetching have on compulsory misses? Yes. If it was perfect prefetching that always prefetched the right thing, it could totally eliminate them. Yeah, pretty much. There'd be like one at the very beginning. But yes, yeah, if, if we were perfect at predicting exactly our memory access pattern, it could effectively eliminate compulsory misses. Um, Is it ever going to hurt compulsory misses? Is there any way that it, it could could cause an increase in compulsory misses? Yeah. You could prefetch something that kicks out another prefetch. Yeah. Uh, that, that, if you're really aggressive and like prefetch like a lot of data that could potentially happen. Yeah, that's true. Um, yes. If you're really bad at predicting and you bring in the wrong things, is that actually, but so is that actually going to cause any additional conflict or, or compulsory misses? Like you just pulled in the wrong thing. You were going to miss anyway. And now you just missed again, right? So, so that not not necessarily. Um, I think the the higher risk is what Jack mentioned is you pulled in some, you prefetch something, and you then you like in your prefetching, you prefetch again over top of the the thing that you actually wanted to prefetch. Um, the, so, what you mentioned will will be an effect on uh, conflict misses for sure. Um, because if you pull in the wrong data um, and evict data that you have currently that you are have used, then you could cause a lot of conflict misses. Uh, Ethan in chat here. Okay, so cool. It looks like looks like answering a, a question here. Okay, yeah. Any other thoughts on the compulsory misses? Okay, I'll let you think for a minute on, on the capacity misses then. Okay, can it have any positive effects on capacity misses? I can't think of any. Um, yeah, so it's not going to help capacity misses. Could it potentially hurt them? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I have some yeses. What? What? How so? It could prefetch uh, a bunch of stuff and fill up the cache, and then you'd get capacity misses. Um, so, 
I would say like yes and also no at the same time. Kind of it depends on how you define your working set. Um, so in the sense that if if those are eventually going to be used by your program or kind of part of the uh, um, uh, working set eventually, then yeah, I would I would agree it it would probably um, affect these capacity misses. But on the other hand, if you just prefetch just like some random thing over here that you're never going to use, well, it actually isn't hurting anything on the capacity miss side because you aren't affecting your working set. It will affect conflict misses though, because you're probably evicting things that you actually want. Um, so, and this kind of brings up like the, the kind of relationship between capacity and conflict. They're fairly similar, right? One of them's, uh, one of them is, um, both of them involve evicting things that we care about and coming back to later. Um, one of them is just because we ran out of room. The other one's because we ran out of uh, associativity in our in our set. Cool. So we've kind of touched on some of the things that uh, uh, pre some of the effects that prefetching can have on conflict misses. But I'll give you a, a minute to think about any additional effects that they can have that it can have. All right, what can, can prefetching cause anything good to happen with conflict misses? Yes, how so? Yes, no, no. What if it prefetches what you need back? Great, great example, right? So if you are able to somehow predict that you're going to loop back around to the start of your array that you evicted, well, it's back there in cache. No, no real conflict miss um, in a sense. Like the prefetch has kind of hit, hid the fact that you had gotten rid of it at some point. That's difficult though, because most of the time it ends up being that you know, you're going through an array and you get, it's very hard to predict that you're going to the start of the array. It's very easy that you're continuing along linearly, but it's not so easy to predict the jump back to the start. But if you're like really smart at prefetching and uh, are able to do that, then, then that would be, uh, that could be good. However, I would say that there's most likely more negative effects. So let's talk about what negative effects we could observe with um with prefetching uh on conflict misses so what what negative effects can you guys think of yeah yeah so prefetching things and evicting the data that we actually care about from our cache um, and just maybe even just totally pulling in things that are totally unnecessary that we'll never need again. Um, I think we might talk about this a little bit. I, I can't remember if there's another slide on this, but uh, let's, let's talk about, think about another thing. What, what about the memory bandwidth? Um, this is, a, this is kind of tangential to this, but as far as memory bandwidth goes, our prefetching can have a very negative effect on that. 
we could end up clogging up the pipe, to, so to speak, with our prefetches, and our actual fetches don't get serviced fast enough. Or if they do get serviced, maybe there's just you know uh, a bit more, um, uh, you know, it, it's just a bit more complicated and, and difficult to pull in the data that we actually care about. Okay, um, yeah, so I think that's pretty comprehensive as far as the, the effect that prefetching can have on our um, different types of misses. And I would say like questions like this are fair game for exams, pretty open-ended um, because I sure as heck can't ask you trivia questions that you can look up um, if it ends up being take home. Okay, so here's a second question. This one's even more open-ended. Um, so let's just say that we have a cast that is um, uh, with cast lines that are 32 bytes. We can assume that integers take four bytes. What uh, the task is, is to write a loop in C that will perform significantly better uh, okay, hold on. There's a question here. Wouldn't the type of negative effect on bandwidth potentially increase compulsory misses? Uh, it wouldn't. It wouldn't really affect compulsory misses. No, it would just make them potentially even more costly um, as far as getting the data. Um, so I, I keep shocking my computer. There we go. Okay. So write a loop in C that's going to perform significantly better. If we have a strided prefetcher, then when using a one block look ahead scheme. Okay. Any questions on this question before we, I, I give you a couple minutes to do this? Everyone remember what the strided prefetcher versus the one block look ahead one is? I'll pull it up while you guys get started. Where'd he go? Okay, any ideas of how to how to even start going about this? What what necessary requirements of this code? What are necessary requirements of this code? Evan. Skipping pieces of the array at a certain interval. Okay, yeah, that's um, that's a great start. What sort of intervals do we need to observe for this to be 
effective. Right, so one block is a subset of strided where n is one, right. exactly. So you want it to be like you know, three n or four n or a hundred. So you want you want it to be yeah exactly you want it to be something that's not one um, to be your stride, and since we have a thirty-two byte cache line, we're probably going to need something like at least sixty-four, so that we hop over the the next the next block. So we, we will read in one block, prefetch the next, and then we'll be like, oh, just kidding, and hop over it. And that would be, you know, there's 64 um, byte jump. Um, so yeah, let's just let's just kind of get a little bit of code down. Um, we'll we'll use a for loop, I guess. And just add a bunch of zeros, and then I plus plus. Uh, well, so what? What actually should we have here? I plus plus will probably perform pretty decently under this one block look ahead. So, what would we need to do? Increase it by n. What do we need n to be? Eight. Yep. So, how many bytes do we need, though? So we kind of need it to be sixty-four bytes ish. How many integers is that going to be? So six, 16 times eight is going to be 64. Okay. And then I don't know, we'll just like, we'll just do a sum. Uh, and we'll assume that the, uh, some array exists. I don't have to um, worry too much. Okay. Oh, what I do. Um, okay. Now, is prefetching going to help at all here? Is another question. Even if we didn't do the stupid step of 16, if we just did a step of one, would we see any uh, performance increase from prefetching? I would I would say potentially not. Most likely, this prefetch is going to take a little while. So maybe we see a marginal increase of performance, um, but it's not going to be great necessarily. We're likely going to see something that's uh, uh, it, it likely isn't prefetching fast enough. So you could add in some additional memory accesses or whatever here to make this take a little bit longer. Um, but this is the this is the key. We have to step by some amount of bytes uh, such that we're ignoring the one block that we we prefetch, um, not taking advantage of it. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so, so 
So maybe we would want to add something like uh, uh, J. I guess so J less than like Pete. So we, we read only the stuff in this current block. Wait, 32 divided by uh, four, eight. So yeah. Um, and then we do this, something like something along these lines, um, I plus J. So now we're taking advantage of the preset or or the, the spatial locality in the single block that we pulled in, but not in the next block because we're skipping over it by this, this increment here, potentially. Oh, plus equals, got to do it right. Yeah, that, that would kind of probably exacerbate this issue and, and, and help with the issue of like the prefetch taking a couple cycles. Taking one thing out of each block. Hmm. So I think that already we had that with this stride. Maybe not entirely understanding. Oh, well, I don't know. This doesn't have to be an actual sum. <laughs> like, I don't know why this code exists, but it would be bad if you wrote it, at least for, for locality purposes. <laughs> um, this is pretty contrived as far as, as far as the application. But if we wanted like to actually sum the list then in a very bad way, then we would have to, you know, like you said, loop back and, uh, and uh, you know, actually, <laughs> Add the add the elements that we missed. Do you have a question? Okay. Anybody else? Again, fairly contrived, but just trying to show. Like, although these are contrived, like the amount of times that code gets written that has behavior like this or similar to this that's kind of bad. Like it's really easy to do this. You have, um, I mean. Just, just going back to the example that we had a couple of slides ago with the restructuring, like that's really easy to do on accident. Just make a huge struct and then make an array of structs. Now you're, you know, skipping a lot. Um, so yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. So let's finish up a, a few different considerations and then we will talk about the project. So write performance. When we do a write, a few things have to happen. First, we have to see if the tag that we care about is somewhere in our cache. So I have to do a tag check. And then we have to do the actual write. So there's two kind of things that we have to do. We have to see is the thing that we want to write to in our cache, and if so, write. Um, so that's going to take two cycles. One for the tag check, the other for writing the data. And there's different solutions to solve this. One of which uh, is um, check the tag and pull out the old data into a buffer and pull in the right data into a buffer as well. So we have two buffers. And if the tag check fails, write back the old data from the old data buffer. Otherwise, write the new data from the new data buffer. Um, so that's one, one option. The other one, which is what actually people do, is you pipeline it. And we will talk very extensively about pipelining in a, a few weeks. Okay. Um, miss penalty. So there's there's some problems, uh, namely, oh, oh dear, that was up, not down. So um, when we write from L1 in back into L2, there's some latency involved. That's going to take some time. Um, and this this happens regardless of whether it's right back or right through. It, it, it's going to be uh, necessary. Um, 
Now, what we can do is we kind of put another cache on our cache. We, we make a write buffer, which is code for a really small cache um, that is just the things that we need to write into L2. Um, so this is one option, uh, and this is used in many processors. Um, but there's a problem. So, so this write buffer may hold an updated value of a location uh, needed by some uh, other miss or write miss. So uh, I think this needs to be a read miss. Anyway, so let's just let's just say that like we we write to in uh, memory address zero, and then we evict it for some reason, or we do a write through, uh, and it's back in this write buffer, and then we read from it. And for some reason, maybe we had also evicted it from L1, and we had to go out to L2. Well, now if we look at L2, it's going to be wrong because it hasn't been written to yet. It's still in the write buffer. Um, So we would have to, we would have a problem. There'd be a one value of the data in the write buffer and one in L2. And if we had a miss, we could, we could have some problems. So the simple solution is just, if we ever have a read miss, just wait until the write buffer has drained. So just let all the writes go through to L2 and then, and then perform the read. That's simple, but stupid. Let's do the faster solution um, where we check the buffer addresses so anything in our write buffer will check against the read a miss address and if it matches then we just return whatever is in our buffer otherwise we'll just do the read out of l2 and it's also pretty important to do the ordering right we want to do the read before we do any of the write buffer writes just so that we have we don't have to you know end up in the back of the queue waiting for the writes to occur in l2 so again yeah adding more caches to your caches. This is kind of always a, a trend um, uh, with computer architecture. We're gonna talk about one, one other thing that's basically that as well. Um, so multi-level caches, again, this, this is dominant in uh, processors these days. Um, Memory, a memory level cannot be both large and fast, so let's use the different uh, cache, caches, make them larger as they get slower. Um, and there's some terms to just know about. First of all, the local miss rate is the miss rate in a cache over the access to a cache. So if we talk about the L1 miss rate, we would be talking about the local miss rate to L1. But we can also talk about the local miss rate on L2 or even in um, L3 or whatever. Our global miss rate is the misses in cache per CPU memory accesses. So total accesses, how many times are we having to go off script to DRAM? And then misses per instruction is misses in cache per number of instructions, fairly self-explanatory um, as well. Um, I'm gonna, uh, let's see, kind of running out of low on time here, but I think we can get through it. So um, if we have a smaller L1, we can, we can have a smaller L1 if there's L2. So this hierarchy actually is able to influence our, our design of lower level caches. Um, so we, we trade some increased miss rates for reduced hit time. So hopefully we, we get, we have a little bit higher miss rate, but we're going to have really good fast hit times in L1 and reduce L1 miss penalty. So these are really good. Um, and on average, it's also going to reduce access energy because we're going to be able to, to uh, it's not going to take as much energy to get data out of our L1 if it's, if it's smaller. Um, we can also use a write through L1 with an on chip L2. So, this L2, having the L2 cache allows us to have a write through L1 because 
the write isn't going to take too much longer than just to L1. Um, and then we can make L2, we can make that write back. So it kind of deals with a lot of the write traffic. Um, so we, we kind of have that as a backstop for our writes. And so they don't go off chip to, to, um, uh, to RAM or, or whatever, it, unless an eviction from L2 occurs. Obviously, if we have, if we have mo more than two levels, same things apply. Uh, this is just talking about a simple uh, two-level cache system. Um, so we don't, we really don't want to do a write through all the way to DRAM. That's pretty bad um, because DRAM's slow. Um, so th th there's another thing to consider, and this is going to question that, that we had earlier. I don't remember who, sorry. Um, so there's different ways that we can, um, different policies for inclusion in different multi-level cache systems. So uh, if we have an inclusive multi-level cache, that means that L2 holds copies of data in L1. So we have an initial state, we, we read X and we pull it into both L2 and L1. So we have to pull it into L2 and then we pull it into L1. Now they both have it. Then we do it the same with Y um, and we put it into both L1 and L2. Then when we evict X from L1, we only will um, evict it from L1. It'll still be in L2. And if we evict from L2, then we also have to do a back invalidation on L1. Um, so we evict Y out of L2, we also would have to get rid of it in L1. So that's inclusive. Um, this is, I think, the predominant one. You can read the Wikipedia article for some different like information about different processors which are using these different uh, inclusion policies. Here's another. So this is exclusive. So L1 cache may hold data not in L2. This is going to the whole, like, can we just pull it straight in? Uh, we probably will pull it all the way into L1 um, and then just leave, leave it out of L2 for now. But eventually we'll have to evict, we might have to evict from L1. And then in that case, then we will put in L2. So this, uh, this L2 becomes like a, a cache for the evicted thing. Keep that in mind because we'll see it again in like two slides. Oh, one slide. <laughs> um, so there's this concept of a victim cache. And this basically is a cache for the things that get evicted. So we say we have L1 and we have a bunch of things mapped to the same set and they keep kicking each other out. Well, when they get kicked out, let's put them in the victim cache here. And if we, if we miss from L1, let's go look in the victim cache. Maybe we just recently evicted it. This is gonna be a, small, a smaller cache. It's gonna be, again, it's a cache for your cache. And if we get a hit, then we, we just move it back into L1. We kind of we kind of get a little bit of an extension on any of the the highly contentious sets that we have in our program. We'll 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 come back to this um, next time and, and go through it again just to uh, make sure everyone understands. But I do want to talk about the project. First of all, um, Alamode, rip Alamode. Um, so if you need access to the Linux machines, I just recommend SSHing in. Uh, Visual Studio code is kind of cool because there's a remote SSH plugin that you can install from the extensions library. You just search SSH and it's like this one. And you can basically connect to 
your like BB136 dash whatever number you want. I'm on dash 11 right now. And then you can do really fun stuff like, um, what is it? I don't actually use this, I just use Vim, but if you don't want to use Vim, which is probably most of you, uh, I don't know how to do this. There's, there's a way to like open up a specific folder. I managed to do it, so I'm sure you guys can figure it out. Um, uh, and then you can, you can even have a built-in terminal on the remote machine. Uh, so this is on BB13611. Make a grade. Obviously, it's failing because it's just the starter code. So that's what I recommend if you want to have a Linux environment. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you have Linux, that's that's better. Um, I wanted to. I feel like I wanted to say something else. Oh yeah. Um, as far as the the rand like thing goes i don't know if the distribution is supposed to be normal or not it just kind of looks normal so like let's just see if the test works and it normally does but it's kind of flaky so if you guys know what distribution is supposed to be let me know i'd be very interested to know um but for now we'll just kind of go with if it fails i'll just manually go check it and see so if it if you upload to grade scope and it gives you a wrong score for rand just I'll, I'll manually grade it to make sure um hopefully the the normal distribution check can, can catch most correct solutions so i don't have to grade as much okay any questions on the project now Um, please use the greater script. I spent way too much time on this. So please use it and run it often, early and often, because it'll like make you feel good about yourself because you'll go from like having zero points to like 20 points by writing six lines of code or so. Um, if you start with Rand. Just generally, do you know why OS is not a prereq for this class? I don't know. Uh, I guess it's a pretty decent question. I guess it's so that you can take it at the same time or. I think that some may just pass if you get it working at all, um, because there may not be evictions on a few of them. <laughs> um, but there's enough random other test cases that we have that it'll catch it. Um, other questions? Yes. The cache is yes, the cache is empty when the program starts. So as the program goes on, you'll fill up the cache. Mm -hmm. And then once the cache is full, it stays full for the remainder of the run. So I would I would modify the what what you're saying just a little bit. I would say that uh, so as the program goes, it fills up the the different sets. And once the set is full, then it will never be not full again. Yeah, so that's when evictions actually start. And I really recommend 
reading the the starter code specifically this function the cache system mem access I, I recommend reading this alongside the readme because if we scroll down to cache simulation behavior well step one if there's a cache hit go to step three well let's go look at the code da 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 oh look oh shoot what i do that's not what i wanted to do this is checking a cache miss okay so the else case must be the cache hit it is and in this case if we have a cache hit what do we do well we go to step three what does step three say it says cache lines uh oh here that's not the right step three this is the right step three if the operation was a right the cache line should be marked as dirty okay if it was a right the cache line should be marked as dirty in this case the nomenclature is modified um, and then step four the replacement policy state must be updated the replacement policy state gets updated and you can read the same for the miss it's step two here if it's a cache miss you need to find where to store the new cache line um, so calculate the set where the cache line needs to be stored you scroll up this is the miss case um, Uh, we we calculate the set where it needs to be stored. It's a set index. Um, if it is full, we need to evict. If it's not full, then we just find a place to put it. Uh, this is that. This is this code. So we find any open spot. If we can't find an open spot, then we have to do this eviction. Oh, look, that's literally what this line says. Step two. Um, and the cache line must be chosen according to the specified replacement policy. And that's exactly what happens here. We're using the replacement policy eviction index. Sorry for C function pointer syntax that sucks. I can't do much about it. Um, and then the last thing here is it, uh, the the cache lines tag needs to be updated with a new cache line, and that happens right here. So, if you're ever confused on like how these functions are used or how they're what they're supposed to do, this is the key. Read this function to understand uh, understand what's going on. Um, and obviously, you can post on Piazza. Ask ask me over email. Um, that's all fine as well. Okay. I think that's it. I will be at office hours. <laughs>